I cannot stop thinking about this movie. It's beautiful, it's grotesque, it's beautifully grotesque, and it's not about what you think it's about at all. This video contains loads of spoilers, so if you plan on seeing it and don't want any spoilers, definitely don't watch. There are a number of wild plot twists that you probably won't be prepared for, or maybe you'll find them incredibly predictable, I don't know. But here are some of the most jaw-dropping plot points that just left me stunned or laughing my head off. Oliver Quick is presented as this dopey loner in the beginning of the film, who is a new student Student at Oxford University. Right away, he's faced with his own insignificance as he's openly teased for what he's wearing, as if this was high school or something, and he has no place to sit in the cafeteria. The cafeteria is a social hellscape. We're thrown into it throughout school, and it's always been horrible, and I've always done my damnedest to avoid it. Ollie ends up finding an empty seat in the cafeteria, totally ostracized from all the buzzing clicks teeming throughout the place. And he just so happens to sit across from another outcast, dressed rather similarly to him, and also wearing a pair of wire spectacles. From here, the movie sort of sets you up for certain narrative expectations following a predictable formula in these sorts of scenarios where the protagonist is an isolated loser who gazes longingly from the flanks at all the beautiful and popular folks hoping for a way into their world. This is a genius move in my opinion because this generic lead-in to the film and this sort of shallow predictability is all a setup. Beautifully done, I might add, but because it's also predictable and generic and has been done in a million different movies before, you still feel safe in the narrative because it's familiar and and at the very least, the film still promises some tantalizing mystery will eventually unfold at the family's estate, despite its generic beginnings. The trailer was so bizarre, it doesn't really spell out what the movie will be, and with good reason, because it eventually devolves rather rapidly into sheer chaos, and the plot is flipped on its head so many times you lose track of who any of the characters are and who you even are at that point. So Oliver, aka Ollie, runs into this utterly beautiful princely scion he'd been eyeing from afar named Felix. And the movie picks no bones about letting you know from the beginning He's obsessed with this man. His deeply infatuated musings are shared from the first person in what some may assume is a post-narrative therapy session, yet again keeping in line with those generic film openings, but you'd be so wrong. My God, are you wrong? In any case, Ali finds the gorgeous, mop-haired, six-foot plus Adonis named Felix sitting on the side of the road looking rather bummed. The tire on his bike has blown out and he's stranded but is also in a hurry to get to class. Desperate to impress and potentially befriend the man he's been low-key stalking from afar, Ollie offers up his own bike then goes a step further and offers to will Felix's busted bike back to campus. As an elated Felix rides off to class with exclamations of how heroic Ali is and how much he loves him and having planted a few grateful kisses to Ali's helmet, Ali stands there deeply smitten and rather pleased with himself that he has been triumphant in winning the affection of his man crush. In this moment, as a viewer, you haven't a clue how calculated it all is. Watching it a second time, it makes your skin crawl to realize Ali isn't just a well-meaning dork who somehow convinced you to root for him in winning Felix's attentions. There's something far more sinister at play that makes his bliss in the aftermath of this exchange seem odious and smug. Clearly feeling he owed Ali a depth of gratitude, Felix, who is surprisingly sweet and sensitive and protective of Ali, keeps him around and they become good friends. I love this relationship so much. It's the main reason I wanted to watch the film and I wish the entire movie was based around this relationship, tenderly exploring their growing intimacy and trust and maybe even letting them fall in love. Alas, it wasn't meant to be, but I wanted it so badly. Anyway, the two became good pals, so much so that Felix often found himself defending Ali against the catty attacks of his snobby friend circle, especially against the film's biggest antagonist. Farley. Some people express criticism that the film's antagonist just happens to be a person of color, but for me, I found that intriguing. As a person of color, I think it's idiotic to treat us with kid gloves and limit what roles we can depict in film to only characters that can be viewed in a positive light. That doesn't help storytelling and that doesn't help people of color. It vastly limits the roles available for them to play 
or that filmmakers are willing to cast them for, for fear of being called racist in the long run. The solution to the lack of compelling roles being written for people of color isn't to reduce them to only the good guys in film. It's to give them characters of depth and complexity and intrigue, which will open a vast array of characters that they can be cast for. So throughout the film, Farley is the proverbial thorn in Ali's side, always present with a snarkily delivered quip to dash Ali back down into his place if he ever gets out of line and forgets where he stands in the grand scheme of things. The sad part is you just hear a ton of projection and envy in his character. Envy possibly because Ali's attentions are not fixated on him like they are on Felix. And this is something that Farley observed right from the beginning. Farley is presented as a keen observer from the moment he's on film, dissecting Ali's appearance, his clothing, his word choices, and his unspoken thoughts at every turn. He's constantly trying to read his mind constantly trying to read him down the country and his barbs are very incisive. They're not just meant to rile him up in my opinion. They're actually showcasing a vulnerability in Farley himself where he can't help but to critique himself through Ali and all the aspects of his own life that he secretly resents. He is an quote unquote other who is somewhat a part of the upper crust Canton family, yet is also marginalized as an outsider in his mind because of his skin color and because of his mother's poor situation, quite literally speaking, where she's lost all she had after moving to America to flee the stuffy English people and now has to rely on Felix's father financially. So now Farley must grudgingly accept the charity that is being offered to him in the form of Felix's father paying for his education, which he squanders like the self-important posturing ingrate he is. But this is what makes his character actually likable. There's layers to him and there's layers to everything he's saying. We see his guys unravel more as the film progresses and we realize his ties to Felix and Felix's family are tenuous and on rocky grounds because his mother has availed herself of her brothers, Felix's father's, charity for so long that the well has finally run dry and he is no longer willing to support her lifestyle. So this would explain Farley's perpetual derision and ennui with all things, particularly the encroachment of the favored Ali, who he seems to fear may replace him. And Lord Felix is one of those characters that everybody adores but who is faithful to none and grows bored of his playthings rather quickly whether they be romantic or platonic a dean moriarty type whose allure and swag can't quite be resisted or explained and like kerouac ali finds himself unable to withstand the magnetism pulling him towards this man day by day hour by hour and minute by minute like an unstoppable bullet train but the inevitable happens as it always does with these sorts of enigmatic men and he grows impatient of ali's company and essentially grows bored of their relationship altogether very shortly into the film mind you he's every bit as fickle as ali describes him in the opening narration of the film sensing he's one step away from being discarded from felix's good graces much like the aristocrat's recent sexual fling ali becomes desperate convenient Recently, Ali's family is struck by tragedy when it's announced that his father has died in some drunken accident. He comes to Felix's dorm room, shaken and in tears, and tells him the news, to which the lovely and compassionate Felix immediately seeks to comfort him. So the souring of their relationship is completely forgotten. Their friendship grows deeper as Felix is determined to cheer Ali up and help him to reconnect with his estranged and abusive family, mostly his mother, who Ali intimated was unstable and drug addled and whose father forced him to stick his fingers down her throat to help her vomit out the drugs she regularly consumed. Very disturbing imagery that instantly makes the viewer sympathize with Ali more emphatically, much like the endearing Felix. He then invites Ali to his family's home as school lets out for the semester to help him have an enjoyable summer after the tragedy he suffered. And after coyly declining, Ali finally accepts. This is where things get interesting. Felix's father is like a member of the aristocracy and they live in a historical castle-like English manor on a sprawling estate called Saltburn, equipped with a butler and footman to boot. I love historical manners and I spent a great deal of time studying the history 
history of them and their protocol and their ties to the landed noblemen who owned them. So in addition to the stunning cinematography and gorgeous color palette of this film, the eye candy only intensified once they arrived at Saltburn. Ali arrives and is rightly gobsmacked by the old world opulence he's been thrust into, which makes Felix seem all the more princely and enchanting than he did before. And quite humble and sweet actually, despite his family's wealth, because he seems to be so accommodating and warm-hearted and inclusive. Funnily enough, he is the antithesis of what Farley represents, despite him being the son of the wealthy aristocrat, and Farley being mostly a poser. Felix's family turns out to be a host of farcical characters, from his high-strung, shallow, and neurotic mother Elspeth, which is a crazy name by the way, played by the ever-brilliant Rosamund Pike, who I love, and her character is hilarious. She likes to gossip behind people's backs as soon as they are out of earshot and even makes them leave the room so that she can talk about him. And then there's his father, who is quite warm, but also kind of blithering and ridiculous. And then there's his oddball and sexually promiscuous sister. And last but not least, the unfortunate Pamela, played by the incredible, incredible Carrie Mulligan, who I love and adore, who is apparently drug addled and homeless and who has far outstayed her welcome after living with the family for an extended period of time. And I must say, the hilarity that ensues once Ollie meets the family is top tier, perfectly timed comedy. This movie boasts so many laugh out loud and utterly ludicrous moments and dialogue that I laughed just as hard on the second watch. Just brilliant writing, by the way. Ali is, of course, taken aback by these characters, but ultimately warms to each of them in his own way, including Farley, who is there at Saltburn for the summer, since, again, he is the cousin of Felix and thus a part of the extended family. At Saltburn and residing in a bedroom adjacent to Felix and even sharing his bathroom, Ali's obsession only deepens. Falling into Ilio Perlman territory. He often creeps about the house observing Felix from afar and let's be honest, who can blame him? And he even spies on him whenever Felix is masturbating. I mean, look at this man. He is not from this world. He is a fucking angel fallen to earth. I swear to God, look at him. Then we get the first of the most disturbing scenes in this film. Ali is lured into the yard in the dead of night for a second time by the unsettling presence of Venetia who is Felix's sister, who has taken to dwaddling beneath Ollie's window as she smokes, hoping to get him to join her in these little clandestine meetings. He heads outside this time and having gotten to know her and her issues a bit, thanks to her mom's oversharing, such as her eating disorder, he demands that she take care of herself and eats to get proper nutrition. This for me is one of the clearest glimpses we see of a transformation taking place in Ali. We also saw it earlier when despite presenting himself as an alienated dork, his sexual prowess and confidence is not to be discounted. We saw that when he was preparing to sleep with the girl Felix had discarded at the same time as he discarded him earlier in the film before his dad died. And then we see it again when the gang demands that he removes his trunks and joins them nude in the grass. I totally expected him to shy away, but my God, I was mistaken. Without qualm, he removes his trunks and saunters cockily, no pun intended, into the bush and they all comment on the size of his junk, which is apparently large, something that'll actually be confirmed by the end of the film. And we see it again here here, this strange dominant side that emerges when he commands Venetia to stop starving herself and purging after dinner. She acquiesces without a fight like a sub. Then when he tries to finger her on the spot, she admits she's on her rag, to which Ali responds that he's a vampire and licks the period blood from her snatch off of his fingers in a scene so gag worthy I had to fast forward it and I do it every time. He then proceeded to eat her bloody you know what right there in the open and was spied on by Farley the entire time and the rest is history. Having watched the film a second time, I now see the glaring illusion in Ali referring to himself as a vampire. Boy is he, and this will become more and more apparent as the film progresses and he slowly destabilizes the family that he successfully ingratiated himself with and so effortlessly it seems. Farley, ever the obnoxious prick, reported what he had seen to Felix, who subsequently gets really sulky and upset. And we're left to assume he's very jealous about losing another friend to his sister. But what's more disturbing is the ease with which Ali lies to clear his name 
and shifts the blame back to Farley somehow. And it's also disturbing how much I found myself rooting for him to be successful in this lie. And I hoped that Felix brought the lie because I really love their relationship so much so that I didn't want anything to jeopardize it. I thought the lie was justified. And dear God, I would realize this mistake among many others towards the end of the film. Now dissuaded from continuing a relationship with Venetia because he refuses to put her above Felix, Ali continues to feud with Farley and obsesses over Felix and eventually sleeps with Farley by the way in a diabolical plot to get him ousted from the house. But back to Felix. This is when we get another of the most disturbing scenes in this film. Felix masturbates and unloads in the tub and after he exits the bathroom, Ali enters it and quite delirious with lust for Felix, kneels down in the tub and caresses his face against the leftover water and jizz and then slurps it up. This is yet another moment redolent of the summery, seductive Italian gay romance called Call Me By Your Name, only far more dark and twisted in its storytelling. It doesn't ring with the same innocence or inquisitive urges of Ilio's self-exploration and romantic obsessions. There is something far, far darker about the slowly unfurling plot of Saltburn. Thanks to the unapologetic writing of Fennel, also Barry's stirring performance. There's something about his actions that rings of rage or even sexual violence, although this is never depicted on screen. It put me in the mind of sadism in some of the scenes and even virtual rape, not a coming of age curiosity or a tender first love because he seems to violate or force himself upon each person he has a sexual encounter with and grows close to a lot of them through manipulation, including Felix, although he's quite unaware of Ali's presence and his actions, therefore he cannot consent to them. And despite how grotesque it all is, it's still positively delicious in the most morbid of ways and quite arresting. I couldn't get enough of this film. Even though I had to fast forward through a few parts, I still couldn't look away. So the film climaxes when Felix, being the darling friend that he is, forces Ali to confront his issues and reconcile with his family since he hadn't been home since the death of his father, which is completely abnormal and in Felix's opinion, it was too strange to go on any longer. However, this is where things take a terrifying turn. Turns out Ali's mother is not an unstable drug addict. She's actually a sweet and doting woman with a lovely home who is elated to see her son. It also turns out that Ali's father is not dead, but very much alive and happy to see his son home for his birthday. Felix is horrified at uncovering Ali's lies and no longer wants anything to do with him whatsoever. And who can blame him really? The truth of the matter was quite chilling, especially to the viewer because you were led along in ignorance just like Felix was, which was a great storytelling device. You were not privy to Ali's deceit because it turns out he's a highly unreliable narrator. Felix then orders him to go home after his big Midsummer's Night Dream themed party that Felix's mom threw for him with a guest list full of loads of strangers who didn't even know his name as they were singing him happy birthday. That was like a really heartbreaking point in the movie. You just realize how utterly pathetic Ali is and how desperate he was all along with intentions that were not exactly pure. So stewing because he's now found out, Ali's sulks about the party alone and gets wasted because Felix refuses to speak to him anymore, even when he begs him. Ali then stalks Felix into a maze in the yard of the manor where he's banging some girl and then he literally interrupts them. Felix and the girl part in disgust and then in front of a creepy statue of the mythical Greek creature Minotaur that may be symbolic in some way, Felix confronts Ali about his freakish behavior and this tense scene culminates with Felix saying what we've all been thinking since the second half of the film. That being, whatever Ali is, he makes his blood run fucking cold. Famous last words indeed. What we don't find out until a few scenes later is that Ali poisons and kills Felix, which is horrible and heartbreaking. That honestly is why the movie continues to stick with me. The fact that he killed him. Like it just, it really bothered me and stuck with me long after I watched it and led to me watching it again. I was just heartbroken by the end of their friendship, but also heartbroken by the death of Felix because he was so perfect. I loved him so much. And the scene of total denial following Felix's death from his father saying they just needed to move him and warm him up and that he wasn't dead to the mother saying, come away, darling, it's nearly lunch. And them all going inside to have lunch while Felix's corpse is 
just rotting in the yard is so fucking funny. I couldn't stop laughing. The hilarity of that scene is so perfectly orchestrated. The crying, the shouting, the small talk to distract from the hideousness of the moment. The butler being unable to close the drapes as the body passes. <laughs> and them gagging as the sound of the gurney being wheeled by suddenly overtakes the room is so funny. <laughs> Felix just became an afterthought instantly, which shows how superficial and detached these people are. This is presumably a commentary on wealthy people in general, I guess. Then, of course, the most vile and debauched scene comes at Felix's funeral. When Ali is left behind at the gravesite, and removes his clothes and begins to fuck the freshly packed dirt. His obsession with Felix cannot be deterred even in death and it is so fucking insane. Ali then goes on a rampage which won't be revealed in depth until the final scenes of the film but mysteriously and hilariously at some points Everyone around him in Saltburn begins dying and he refuses to leave. It was so funny when they cut to Venetia's funeral and her rock under the water. <laughs> but Felix's dad at last pays Ollie off to get him to leave because the mother doesn't want him to leave. But then Felix's dad dies years later as well and quite mysteriously. So does the mother who really gets the worst of them all as her suffering at the hands of Ollie is prolonged and quite brutal. This occurs six 16 years after the initial trip to Saltburn with Felix, which was in 2006. So um, when he kills Felix's mother, it's actually 2022. As it would turn out from day one, even with Felix's deflated bicycle tire, Ali has been meticulously playing him and his entire family, seemingly to obtain Saltburn all along. That part seemed kind of unclear to me. It was difficult to understand what his exact motive was, or when it formed, or if it was evolving as the movie progressed and he grew closer to these people. So I'm still not sure as to what his motive was. And my one complaint of Saltburn was that it didn't quite land on any of the intrigues that it played up in the buildup of the film when it came to Felix and Ali. And the point that it did finally hone in on at the end made absolutely zero sense for the plot. It wasn't exactly clear why Oliver set up this elaborate ruse to capture Felix's attention or why he continued to plot on his family throughout the film following Felix's death. Was it always Oliver's goal to obtain Saltburn? Was he seduced by the wealth and opulence and thus his desperation to own Felix was overtaken by his desire to claim Saltburn for himself? His motives still seem very ambiguous at the end no matter how you look at it. Somehow throughout the film, the Felix obsession seemed to be a massive red herring to Oliver being a sadistic, materialistic social climber or an opportunist on the hunt for wealthy prey. He never came off as resenting his class or looking to be upwardly mobile and he never came off as superficial either so I just don't really get it. In fact, Oliver remained a blank canvas throughout the film, which probably the viewers and even Farley just projected our opinions and ideas onto. He was really only distinguishable by his sob story and being from a lower class family and also his obsession with Felix, which at points seemed due to fascination with someone whose existence and appearance was antithetical to his, but also at times seemed purely carnal. So I do wonder at his obsession with Felix as well, what was driving it was he sexually attracted to him? Was he enamored by him, his lifestyle, his wealth, his popularity, his beauty? Um, I wish those things were a little bit clearer, but that's all we really know about this character, that his lust for or his infatuation with Felix was his driving force. Then when we arrived at Saltburn, that suddenly and Ali takes a back seat to showcasing Felix's twisted and eccentric family, but I do understand some critics' frustration with the film's ultimate point, as it was teed up as some sort of ether-rich social commentary film or a film that would delve into a critique of class disparity and wealth gaps, but none of this ever really comes to fruition in the film. But I'm not sure it necessarily needs to be a social critique. I don't really agree that every film has to provide some kind of uh, social commentary or some kind of criticism of something going on in culture. I just don't agree with that take at all and I hate that a lot of films are being made quote unquote woke now because they all have this agenda of criticizing something to do with culture or society and films don't always need to go that route. Some films can be political, that's fine, but 
not all films need to go that route. And I do enjoy films that are more stylistically driven or writers who write unapologetically and are unafraid to showcase their craziest, most outlandish ideas in their film. I love that sort of storytelling, which is why this film really spoke to me. I'm willing to take the director at her word that she never really intended this film to thoroughly address those sort of social commentary elements that people tried to dig out of the film and then critiqued her for not fleshing out. Essentially, she's saying you're reading too much into everything. I believe she insisted at some point this film was about first love, but even then, it still technically falls majorly short. Of course, I didn't expect for it to be an outright romance because it's clear the film had darker undertones and was sort of farcical in nature and leaned more towards black comedy, which it delivered very well on, by the way. The writing was impeccable. But I was also really disappointed that we didn't see Felix's and Ollie's relationship deepen after they arrived at Saltburn. I thought Saltburn would tie everything in and it really didn't deliver on that. It would have been incredibly intriguing if their returning to his family's home unlocked a deeper intimacy between them even if it still ultimately turned dark in the end. But it would have been nice if we learned the secrets of Felix that lied behind his sunny, breezy nature, what really drives him and why he came to be the way he is. Or it would have been intriguing if Oliver cleverly used his access to Felix's family and his private life to successfully pave a way into his heart, even through manipulation like he did with the sob stories about his own family. The scenes of Felix masturbating were really the only scenes that drove the central plot about his obsession with Felix forward once they arrived at Saltburn. Other than that, their relationship fell kind of flat in the second half of the film, taking a back seat to the family. So when it came to the ending of their relationship, it didn't seem as charged as it could have because the storyline had been so neglected at that point with unnecessary plot diversions, such as Ollie sleeping with Farley and seducing Venetia, and even beginning to seduce Elspeth as well. I felt far too much time was devoted unnecessarily to developing his useless relationship with Felix's sister, especially, who was a boring, one-dimensional character that was shallowly driven between Felix and Ali for a hot second, and which would have been far more intriguing if it was driven further and brought out Felix's true feelings for Ali. And she was also just there to be fodder for one of the film's most grotesque scenes, which was clearly contrived to disturb viewers as much as possible. It all just felt kind of all over the place. And I think the film could have benefited from relying more on its strengths, which was like the black comedy, which it did really well with, but also developing the relationship between Felix and Ali far more than it did before letting it end in tragedy. I found the idea of this relationship between someone like Felix and someone like Ali deeply fascinating, not only because of the class disparity, but more because they seem like polar opposites of one another in every way. The height difference is adorable, and the fact that Felix is classically handsome and Ali isn't, he has a more rugged, unique handsomeness. I just found the pairing to be of a particular interest and would have loved to see the outcome of Ali broaching his feelings to Felix before his lies were exposed, just to see if Felix felt anything for him more than friendship, or if Ali was just deluding himself the entire time. Even if it ended in rejection, which actually could have driven the plot forward in a more coherent way than just the lies about Ali's family, I would have loved to have seen Ali make a move or even a scene where Felix catches Ali watching him masturbate and has a strong reaction to it, whether positive or negative. I just feel like this was such an intriguing relationship and it was by far the most intriguing relationship in the film, apart from Ali and Farley, and it just became a missed opportunity in my opinion. But the film still delivers in a lot of other ways, just not in the ways I personally wanted. I know some people may disagree, but I think that that had Ali and Felix been intimate at some point before Ali's lies were exposed, or if Felix had confessed feelings for Ali in the very least, it would have made their final scene together so much more powerfully charged, and their relationship wouldn't have seemed so shallow or like an afterthought once they arrived to Saltburn, which brought on so many other distractions that stole screen time. It also would have made Felix's killing and the grave scene way more potent had their relationship relationship been fleshed out more, but I guess now we can only imagine.